Uh, good afternoon to you. It's 406 here, News Talk 105.9 WMAL. We're, we're making sense of the news coming up in the next hour. Tom Fitton will be here at 430 from Judicial Watch. And then Reagan Reese joins us at 5 o'clock from the White House's press pool because she's a Daily Caller White House correspondent. And you can join us at 888-630-9625, 630 wmal In the age of AI... It's getting easier to make parody videos, including this one. This is a this is a YouTube channel called Mr. Reagan, and they made a a, a parody uh, ad about Kamala Harris, and it made Gavin Newsom very angry. Here's what it sounds like: I, Kamala Harris, and your Democrat candidate for president, because Joe Biden finally exposed his senility of the debate. Thanks, Joe. I was selected because I am the ultimate diversity hire. I'm both a woman and a person of color. So if you criticize anything I say, you're both sexist and racist. I may not know the first thing about running the country, but remember, that's a good thing if you're a deep state puppet. I had four years under the tutelage of the ultimate deep state puppet, a wonderful mentor, Joe Biden. Joe taught me rule number one, carefully hide your total incompetence. <laughs> a really funny. Uh, yeah. And uh, so Gavin Newsom was worried that people would think that that was real. It sounded too close to the truth for his for his liking. So as a result, this week, he signed what the Daily Mail is referring to as America's toughest law banning political deep fakes. It is illegal to try and tell jokes in public. For more on this, I want to bring in Eric Sell now. He's an associate counsel and Shillman Legal Fellow at the Center for American Liberty, and he joins us on the phone. Hello, Eric. Good to have you with us, sir. Thanks for having me, Vince. What did Gavin Newsom do here? Well, he and the legislators in California are trying to kill a mosquito with a shotgun. That's what's happening here. Um, I mean, there's this concern, obviously, of AI creating deep fakes and, and you know, manipulating and misleading people uh, in, into voting a certain way. Um, but this bill does much more than that. It, it bans um, videos like the one you just played that are quite obviously satire. Uh, they're fake. Uh, it's funny that, you know, this is core First Amendment protected speech, including, uh, you know, an AI generated video. Um, it, it's quite obviously a parody. Yeah. So, you know, the, the, these new sets of laws that the California legislature just passed and, and Newsom just signed uh, are really, you know, uh, attempts to silence core political speech, not preventing people from being misled by yeah. AI generated videos. Well, and uh, did- if they wanted to do that, if they wanted to do that, they could have, you know, Run these uh, the statutes much, much more narrowly. So, in addition to demonstrating that they're humorless scolds, uh, what are the consequences of violating this new California law? What could happen to you if you make a, a video like the one we just played? Oh, well, there's significant penalties attached to it. I mean, the the attorney general um, is, is tasked with uh, enforcing this against social media companies. For for one, I mean, the social media companies are effectively being enlisted into this regime by the state of California to be you know, the state's puppets to go out and root out this type of uh, deceptive video that's on their platform. So, you know, th- there's certainly that penalty and then the individual penalties as well for violating it. Um, you know, it's, it's akin to uh, discouraging people from voting or other or, or other types of severe uh, crimes where, you know, you're interfering with the exercise of fundamental right. Uh, so this is serious stuff. And, and people who are exercising their First Amendment, uh, you know, speech rights by creating these videos are going to get Uh, caught up in this dragnet. Yeah, well, and it's also consistent with uh, something we've seen uh, the left doing a lot um, in terms of just trying to criminalize uh, mockery of the left. That's one of the big things. In fact, um, I remember it was the Biden administration who uh, charged and successfully scored a conviction of and threw in jail a man called Douglas Mackey, who made um, uh, parody uh, voting memes about Hillary Clinton. He said, you can text your vote. Like, nobody thinks that. It's it's an obvious it's obvious parody. They prosecuted the guy and threw him in jail for seven months. Yeah, it's this is an extension of exactly that. And, you know, you see this from the Biden administration. You see this from blue states uh, and blue governors like Gavin Newsom. Uh, they, they really just don't like speech um, that they disagree with. That's what it comes down to. They think that uh, the rest of us are all rubes and we're all going to be duped into uh, voting the wrong way if, if people are allowed to exercise their First Amendment. And that's just not true. Uh, and, and frankly, you know, if people don't want to vote for Kamala Harris because, uh, you know, someone else has exercised their First Amendment right, 
it's not up to the government to try and prevent that from happening. That's the, the system that we live in in this country. They seem to be especially annoyed by mockery. Why, why is that? Why is mockery the, the area that they seem to target so aggressively? It's because there's so much truth to it, I think. You know, the, the, there's uh, that's what satire is and parody is, is it's kind of, you know, playing up the, the caricature that is these people. And when you call them out for how ridiculous they are and you do it in a, a mocking way, uh, it, it touches a nerve and it touches a nerve uh, so significantly that they, they turn around and, and pass laws to, to criminalize what you're doing. Yeah. Uh, so I think that's that's exactly what's going on here. And, and in terms of the law and what laws already exist on the books, it strikes me that um, the various uh, fraud laws would probably cover a lot of the, the, the bad uses of artificial intelligence that one could imagine, right? Because – if I were to like cook up some sort of AI voice with an intention to mislead someone, to pretend that that voice was uh, genuinely delivering the message that I had actually authored, but but I kept that detail from my audience, it doesn't that doesn't that sort of hit some of the tripwires for fraud uh, in, in terms of the legal statutes across the country? I would think that it would already be pro- prohibited by current laws on the books in, in California. You know, there there's it, it's. Uh, unlawful, or you can be subject to civil liability if if you defame someone. So if you created an AI video that was defamatory, that's already uh, something that you know gives rise to legal liability in the state of California. They don't need to pass some additional law on top of that, creating these criminal penalties, um, especially one as broad as this one. And and you know, in addition to that, uh, if you're talking about commercial speech uh, in misleading people about the efficacy of a product that you're selling, for example, uh, that's already prohibited. So if someone were to create an AI video to do that, you know, that would also be prohibited. Yeah, I mean, we've uh, heard so, like horror stories, for instance, of, of um, like, you know, grandparents at, who are taken advantage of by the fact that some criminal got their kid's voice or their, ch- their grandchildren's voice, and then they use it, they pump it into AI, they deliver a, a fraudulent message, help, I need money. Uh, and we've got, you know, elderly people who are, are falling for it. That strikes me as textbook defra- fraud and and, uh, and theft. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, that falls into a well-established doctrine that the Supreme Court has looked at, you know, regarding uh, speech integral to criminal conduct. You know, the criminal conduct there is defrauding elderly people out of money. Yeah. Uh, you don't have a First Amendment right to do that just because you're using an AI-generated uh, voice or video to do that. Uh, but what's happening here is, you know, you're you're talking about – uh, satire and parody that's quite obviously that it's not illegal uh, and just because you know someone's using ai to make it look like kamala harris is saying some ridiculous thing you know doesn't mean that they're engaging in in uh an attempt to, to interfere with the election process they're exercising their first amendment rights yeah for sure and uh and and here you have uh, gavin newsom going after um people who are, do- who are doing obvious parody as you point out eric um, what is the likeliness that Democrats have an appetite to do this at the national level, not just in California? I think you're going to see a push for this. You're going to see a push for this in Congress. Um, I, I think this, this, uh, these two bills, these two laws in California are probably going to be struck down in short order. There's already been lawsuits filed against them. Uh, they're, they're so ridiculously overbroad, uh, the way that these two laws are drafted, that uh, I, I don't think it'll take much for a court to, to see these as First Amendment and um, you know, 14th Amendment due process violations here. Uh, and hopefully that will indicate, you know, or send a signal to Congress, like, hey, don't do this. But of course, you're going to strike it down. Um, it, it's not worth it. It's just going to be a waste of everyone's time and, and the federal government's money if you pass a law like this only for it to be in joint court. Um, but I, I don't think that's going to stop, you know, really uh, performative members of Congress from going out and it. Yes, that do almost the same thing. And also, this this feels like the kind of thing that um, is going to result in very selective prosecutions. So if um, if if you have Democrats who are uh, who are trafficking in quote materially deceptive content, uh, my guess is that the state of California is not going to be prosecuting them with any aggression. Yeah, it, it'll be the Republicans and the conservatives and the Trump supporters. Uh, you know, those are the ones who are the target of this. It's not folks who, who are on the other side of things. And, and I think there's a lot of leeway here for the state of California to enforce this selectively, like you suggest. And, you know, that's why it's so dangerous, because it's really putting the state's thumb on the scale in favor of one political party or, or one point of view. And, and that's a plain violation of the First Amendment. Finally, I, I should I should have mentioned earlier, you are representing um, the YouTube creator that whose video I played at the top, Mr. Reagan. 
Um, what what does that what does that mean? Is is uh, Mr. Reagan in any peril here? Uh, well, actually, the Center for American Liberty isn't representing him. Hamilton Lincoln Law Institute is representing him, and, and he's in good hands with them. Oh, but, good. Uh, I do. I, I do think that you know. Uh, he, he th- these two laws were were enacted in large part in response to the video that, that he created. Yeah. Uh, and I, you know, he is his story is very much up front and center in this lawsuit that was filed. Um, so hopefully, you know, the courts will be well aware that he's uh, essentially targeted by uh, these laws, and you know, hopefully, he won't be in any jeopardy uh, while these lawsuits are pending. But you know, one of these statutes is currently in effect. The other one doesn't take effect till, until January 1st. So in theory, you know, he could be prosecuted under the one that's currently uh, in effect. For a video that he had already created prior to the existence of the law? Potentially. If the, if the video is still up on his YouTube channel, who knows? Maybe the state of California will, will decide it's worth going after him, you know, local prosecutor or whatever, whoever, whoever has the authority to bring an action wow. against him. Um, they, they may do so. Uh, hopefully they don't, but we'll, we'll just have to wait and see. Okay, Eric, thank you very much. Eric Sell with the Center for American Liberty, sir. Good to talk to you today. Thanks for having me, man. That's an important topic and uh, it demonstrate, you know, demonstrates uh, the kind of appetite that the left has to clamp down on speech that mocks them. That's what this is. At its core, it's, uh, it's Gavin Newsom going after parody and criminalizing it. How dare you make fun? of Gavin Newsom or Kamala Harris. Um, Earlier this week, we heard from Hillary Clinton, who wants to go after American citizens who engage in propaganda, either civilly or criminally, she said. She had this to say on NBC. But I also think there are Americans who are uh, engaged in uh, this kind of propaganda. Uh, And whether they should be civilly or even in some cases criminally charged uh, is something that would be a better deterrence. A a woman who uh, quite obviously has trafficked in all sorts of what we now refer to as disinformation, lies designed to influence our elections. She uh, spent uh, money, the DNC money, campaign money on the Steele dossier in order to generate a, uh, a huge dossier of lies about her political opponent That was used to both attack him during the 2016 election and then to subsequently stagger his presidency. She was using that as a means to stage an insurrection here in the United States. And it was these were lies. And and by the way, easily provable lies in some cases, very easily provable lies. But it was the the P tape and on and on and on. Uh, And that's what she did uh, and has never suffered any consequences for for interfering in our elections in that way. Never, never. But here she is advocating that her political opponents be imprisoned for expressing ideas that she disagrees with or imperils the power of her party. It's the same thing we heard from Merrick Garland last week, isn't it? The the attitude about all of this. Merrick Garland came out and gave us that finger-wagging statement last week about how, oh, how dare you pick on the United States Department of Justice? How dare you scrutinize us? How dare you single out senior officials for criticism? That's very dangerous, he said. He didn't say it was dangerous because of any real or actual threats to anyone or real or actual attacks to anyone. He said it was dangerous because... People were spreading what he referred to as, quote, conspiracy theories, or they were, quote, bullying Justice Department officials by singling them out. I'm sorry. That's core First Amendment speech that he's talking about. Criticism of your government? It's kind of the whole point to have that speech protected. And Merrick Garland uh, gave an entire very hysterical statement last week about how dangerous that is. Hillary Clinton says that she wants to imprison people who spread what what she decides as propaganda. And Gavin Newsom, good old greasy Gavin out there in California, has now made it illegal to tell jokes about him and his political party. All right, let's see here. I've got a Penny calling in from Burke now on line two. Hello, Penny. You're on the Vince Colony Show. Hey Vince, uh, thanks for uh, taking my call. Yes, ma'am. Um, I wanted I wanted to point out that Saul Alinsky in Rules for Radicals stated that ridicule was the most powerful tool. 
Yes, and his 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 reasoning for that was that there's no defense for it, or if it, it's very hard to defend against. I think the answer to ridicule is typically counter ridicule. It's that uh, you can just be funnier and uh, more aggressive. Usually, you see that work on a stage, for instance, where uh, the person who gets attacked has a better quip fired back. That's how they win. But that is that's one of right. uh, Saul Alinsky's uh, core tenets, right? This that that uh, ridicule yeah. is so powerful for taking down your opponents, which is why they're trying to outlaw it, Penny. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, luckily we do have, uh, you know, we do have the Bill of Rights. And, yeah. and uh, so um, hopefully this will be challenged immediately and put down by the court. I hope so. Um, but, you know, if you examine uh, Donald Trump's performance against Joe Biden, he got a little bit of ridicule in there. Yeah. But Kamala Harris's uh, performance against uh, Donald Trump, she got some ridicule in there. And it's, it, it is so frustrating to the person that's being ridiculed because, like you said, they can't hardly defend against it. Yeah, they, they thought defending. they had something for a minute. That's what, like, the, uh, the Harris-Walls campaign has been resting on this. Oh, Trump's, Trump and, Her- and Vance are weird. That's their, uh, their form of ridicule. Uh, and uh, they, thought they, they thought they had something there. But people get tired of listening to the same joke over and over. And they're like, all right, fine, can we get the policy now? And it turns out they don't have any of that to share. Right, right. Well, I'll let you move on to next to the next caller. I look forward to hearing what they also have Thanks, to say. Thanks, Penny. As always, appreciate the call. Sam's in Alexandria, line three. Hello, Sam. You're on the Vince Colony Show. Uh, thank you so much, Vince. I appreciate you taking my call. You know what I found really rich about that uh, that quote from Hillary Clinton? Whatever we have to say about her, she is one of the you know most known and top officials within the Democratic Party, which is arguing about how uh, former President Trump and you and myself and everybody else that supports him are threats to democracy. But she would try to also, in the same breath, uh, almost talk about propaganda and how that needs to be criminalized and outlawed when, you know, we look at the, I would say, the most important of all in the Bill of Rights, the First Amendment, the ability to express yourself, the abil- the freedom of speech, yeah. uh, of, of redress against the government, all of those things. And as you so rightly said, you know, the uh, propaganda, hate speech, that's all in the, beh- in the eye of the beholder. And who sets the standard for that? Uh, because if, if she does, then I think we're all in trouble. Yeah, you're totally right, because... She doesn't really want free speech. It's just it's just a game of pretend. The propaganda is the stuff that challenges her power, which is why she wants you criminalized for that. More in a moment. We're going to talk with the great Tom Fitton. Uh, his organization, Judicial Watch, has been digging in on all of these assassination attempts on President Trump. Stay, t- stay with us. Well, good afternoon to you. It's 436 now. News Talk 105.9 WMAL, where we're making sense of the news coming up. At 5 o'clock from the Daily Caller, Reagan Reese is here with a look at that upcoming CBS debate between J.D. Vance and Tim Walls. That takes place October 1st. What are the chances CBS puts on a fair debate? <laughs> Reagan Reese is digging in for the answers to that question. We'll, we'll share those with you coming up. And you can join us at 888-630-9625, 888-630-9625. WMAL. Joining me now is Tom Fitton. He's the president of Judicial Watch, the author of A Republic Under Assault, and he's on the phone. Hello, Tom. Good to have you with us, sir. Hey, Vince. Good to be with you again. Thank you. I want I want to start with you on uh, yet another assassination attempt on President Trump. The left, of course, is blaming him for this, saying, "Well, he he got what was coming to him." Uh, that's that's basically been the tenor of all of the coverage uh, since then. Um, what do you make of it? How is it possible that the Secret Service yet again has allowed a gunman to get this close to Donald Trump? I think it's willful negligence. Uh, they've made a political decision to deny him the full level of protection, uh, despite him being previously targeted for assassination, despite uh, the risks that he faces uniquely as a candidate and, and a target of a foreign um, government, the Iranians. Uh, it, there's no excuse. And when something happens that's unexplainable by a government agency, you know what you should think about? It's politics. It's just pure politics. And it's dangerous politics. Is 
as you highlight, the left has crossed yet another Rubicon in terms of democratic norms, uh, basically saying, well, you know, if you get killed and you're our opponent, it's you, you're to blame, which, of course, necessarily encourages more attacks. Uh. These are dangerous times, uh, you know, for our country because, you know, these failures by the Secret Service, in my view, encourage additional attacks because others think, well, maybe I can accomplish my goal of ending Trump's life. And uh, my gosh, I just hope we get through the election with Trump being alive. I, uh, one of the areas that I'm interested in getting answers to in terms of this latest assassination attempt is how does this guy know that Donald Trump is going to go to that golf course? And and to what extent was he camping out, for instance, on a routine basis with the hope that Trump might show up at that golf course. I just don't have the answer to those questions. One would think that if they were able to track his cell phone data to demonstrate he was there for 12 straight hours waiting for Trump, why aren't we seeing cell phone data from him for weeks past to let us know what was his pattern? How how frequently was he attempting this? What what are you looking for here, Tom? Well, I'm looking for, in addition to the fair questions you raise, is who knew what and when about this guy? Yes. And we had the Wall Street Journal report, the town hall report about folks in Ukraine who were very much aware of him. And my my guess is, based on my experience understanding the way CIA works, pretty much any American uh, operating in Ukraine fighting that war would be on the CIA's radar. And they wouldn't be doing their job if they weren't tracking Americans in another country fighting a war, especially when one like was happening in Ukraine. Certainly the FBI, he should have been on the FBI's radar similarly. So, you know, my question is, what do they know about this guy and when? And uh, why wasn't he tracked, uh, given the various statements he was making to for anyone who would listen, that his enemies needed to die? Yes, uh, frequently. And that and that seems to have informed, uh, to the extent that we can establish a rationale, his decision to try and take target Trump. He was angry at him about his Ukraine positions. He expressed on social media earlier this year that he supports Joe Biden because he thinks he, quote, defends democracy. Meanwhile, he was using the same White House talking point saying that Donald Trump is a threat to democracy. I've noticed the press has not shared those social media posts because they undermine their party's uh, uh, power. But uh, he, he's been pretty public about this, hasn't he, Tom? Yes, uh, remarkably public. And on top of that, I, you know, you're asking questions about the second assassination attempt. Yeah. We're still in full cover up mode on the first assassination attempt. Uh, we have yet to receive any documents under FOIA from the Secret Service and FBI. They're so- citing ongoing law enforcement investigations as a, as an excuse, not really a reason to withhold the information from us and the American people. And it's been, you know, three, was it now three weeks? Not that long. Yeah. It was, it, you know, it was poor, a short while yeah, ago. It was, it was July 13th, right? When uh, we got the, the first one. Oh, two months. Excuse me. Two yeah. months. I was thinking three months. It's two months. Yeah. And now August 5th, September 15th, that is uh, uh, yet again. And those are just the ones we know about, Tom. I said earlier this week, we're, we're just publicly aware of these assassination attempts. I have no idea how frequently this occurs. And the other big issue is the Secret Service, right? And, you know, besides the politics, it's the competence and whether the agency is functional in terms of it's able to perform its core mission. And we, we had these documents come out uh, from Judicial Watch's litigation showing their DEI obsession. And what they're encouraging people to do in these trainings is to report on each other. If they, if they, if they um, say the wrong thing, even object to DEI uh, could uh, be result in a discrimination complaint. So what, what a nightmare agency over there. And of course, Trump, I mean, of course, Biden let his dogs attack 25 agents. Uh, yeah. And of so course, you can be, where's the leadership when that happened? So you can be fired for a DEI violation, but if you let a sniper get on a roof and shoot Donald Trump, uh, very few people are held accountable. Right. And we don't even know who to hold accountable there and, and why, because they're hiding the information. I mean, this is, an emer- this is an emergency. Right now, we can presume the Secret Service can't protect any of their protectees. There's no evidence they can. They failed twice with Trump. Why would Biden, to be fair, be any more confident or Kamala or Waltz or J.D. Vance or the former presidents who are protectees? They're all at risk. 
This is an emergency. We should treat it as an emergency, deploy every assets necessary, deploy the military if necessary to protect these men so, and women. So think, it's unacceptable, this risk so Tom, in our country. Tom, as, as a guy who who's really spends your life digging into what the government knows or doesn't know and what, what documents they're hiding from the rest of us, um, I'm, I'm curious about your reaction to Senator uh, Richard Blumenthal this week. I want to play some audio from him. He, he's been saying a couple times now to the media that he's furious at DHS for stonewalling him uh, from information about the, the uh, Butler, Pennsylvania attempted assassination on Donald Trump. Take a listen to this. I am reaching the point of total outrage because the response from the Department of Homeland Security has been totally lacking. In fact, I think it's tantamount to stonewalling in many respects. If necessary, I'll certainly support a subpoena. What do you read from that? What, why is Richard Blumenthal saying this? This is unusual. Well, you know, I talk about the politics, but the politics also works on behalf of public accountability to sense these men and women recognize uh, they're uh, there for the grace of God go them, right? And personal security and for a politician is very important, and it's very direct when they see another politician almost lose their life, uh, or uh, now in this case twice. Yeah. Uh, and, and they recognize that, you know, m- maybe even though we've been playing games with Secret serv- Service protection, Maybe it's not the games that are the problem, that the way the agency is being run is the problem, and it means that everyone is at risk. I'm hoping. Yeah, I'm hoping, too. I'm, I'm hoping that his, uh, his quest for some answers here uh, helps the rest of us get them. Okay, let me, uh, right. move, let me move on to uh, uh, another issue with you. Springfield, Ohio, um, a much maligned Springfield, Ohio. The left has tried to mock the citizens of that town for their concern about what's happened to it. Um, you've been digging in, trying to get some answers. What has Judicial Watch discovered? Well, we got this curious document from the spring. Her cat went missing, but she blamed her Haitian neighbors. Let me pause. Let me pause for a second. Hey, Tom, Tom, in her backyard and thought that might. Hey, Tom, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but we, the audience didn't hear much of what you just said. Your phone broke up, but just take it from the top. Oh, Okay. Yeah, we got we received from the Springfield County, the Springfield uh, Police Department in Ohio, a uh, police report taken a woman who accused her Haitian neighbors, perhaps, of taking her cat who'd gone missing. It was kind of an odd, uh, an odd report because she said she found a piece of meat in the backyard, thought it might be part of her cat, and she wanted to put in the, in the refrigerator in the freezer and save it for cremation. Wow. Uh, subsequently, suppose you know other reports and the and the cover letter they sent to us said, "Oh, the cat was found safe and sound after all." What's interesting is this shows that someone was calling, however unfairly, about Haitians in this regard. And the question is, were there other calls like that? This is the only document we got, and um, you know we're asking questions of the city manager as yes. well. So you know, in the end, the question remains. Why were 20,000 or however many Haitians placed in this in the middle of Ohio by the Biden administration? So this is at least as far as I can remember, the second such police call that I'm aware of in Springfield, Ohio, where you had a resident raising a concern about an animal being uh, seized up by some of the Haitian migrants. And um, that that we were told at the outset that no such calls existed. In fact, that was a feature of I'm pretty sure that was David Muir's quote, fact check during the ABC debate. No, there were no such calls or anything like this. It turns out that was a lie. You have uh, evidence that there was a call like this. Again, it sounds like the story ended well, that she found her cat, according to the Wall Street Journal digging in on this. Uh, But we've been lied to about whether or not the cops did receive calls to this effect. Right. And, you know, and J.D. Vance, who's a senator from Ohio, we forget that in the kind of the media hubbub of this, you know, said he's had constituents you know, more than a handful, 10 yeah. or so, as, as I recall from his statements, who raised these issues. So something was going on there. I don't know what it is. Sure. Uh, but the, the overreaction here, uh, they're more concerned about, um, you know, the idea that someone could be, be complaining about a, what I consider to be illegal aliens. I know uh, Biden pretends they're legal by paroling them in. Uh, you know, 20,000 people just placed there uh, through uh, the, the uh, basically uh, through the sweep of a pen yes. by the Biden administration. 
and we're not allowed to complain about it, and, and the stress that it causes on the community. They want you to That's stop noticing. That's what this is all about, the stress on the community. Yeah, they want, they want you to stop noticing. Uh, in fact, back in March, well before CNN was even aware that a town called Springfield, Ohio, existed, uh, the city manager, Ryan Heck, went to uh, one of their uh, regular meetings and had this to say about what he was hearing in the community. And one of the things that, hurt, that I heard that bothered me very much, and I've actually had quite a few people contact me here lately, um, is some pretty horrid things occurring to domesticated animals in the neighborhood. Um, we've had some stuff in the park um, that, um, again, they, they're being taken advantage of for reasons other than and if you shake your head, Brian. But no, I no, no, I asked, yeah. saying, I yeah. asked me if there was proof. There okay, is no just proof. don't have proof it, of it. I have, I have the same thing. People that have confided in me have asked me for anonymity. I'm not, I can't give their names up. But, I mean, we haven't seen the proof that you're, that you're talking. And I've, right. heard, I've heard about it, too. Yeah. Okay, so here you have local officials talking about this very issue in March of last year. I didn't hear Donald Trump's voice among them. That sounded like just local Springfield people having this discussion, Tom Fitton. Uh, and it's, I think, drawing attention to this has really, I think, shocked a lot of the country when you see 20,000 foreign nationals have been dropped on a town of 58,000 Americans. Yes, and it's not only in Springfield, Ohio, it's other communities throughout the country. Every town is a border town. When you're importing millions of uh, non citizens in the course of three or four years, you know, they don't go just to one place. They're all over the country, and those numbers have extraordinary impacts on the communities. And, you know, they don't get the support. And in the case of, of Haiti, what I kind of been educated about that I, I didn't even understand is that these aliens rot, come into the community. They get subsidies from the federal government through NGOs yes. and, other, and other benefits. And uh, there's an incentive by property owners to rent to them in a way that makes it uh, impossible for or increases rents for citizens in the community. So we talk about housing prices, we talk about rents, and we ignore one of the um, uh, forces that are causing rents and housing to rise. Well, and we see it up right up front in, in, in Springfield. And your listeners should look into it. It's pretty remarkable, the testimony and the witness statements and the reporting on yes. it. And, and one of the other kind of the pieces here that we don't have all the clearest answers on yet is to what extent did the local government officials in Springfield own property that is now being rented uh, by and, and heavily sub- subsidized by federal taxpayers? In other words, uh, forget not just Biden and Harris, but what have the what have the leadership in Springfield been doing to their residents? What have, what about Governor Mike DeWine, uh, who has, by the way, he maintains a charity in Haiti. Uh, to what extent is is he a part of the sabotage of his own citizens? I, I think there are a lot of important good governance stories to unwrap here. A million plus people have been moved in by plane or other means through this parole program by Biden. And he initiated it to uh, ease pressure of these folks walking across the border. Yeah. So he just brought them in on planes. And we've never really had that before in American history. The, the, the largest human trafficking operation, I would submit, in human history. Uh, Tom Fitton, Judicial Watch. Thank you for always digging in, getting us the answers we need. Thank you, Tom. Good to talk to you today, sir. All right, line two, that's where we find Tom in Cincinnati, Ohio. Tom, good afternoon, sir. Hey, Vince. I I was just telling Corey that, uh, you know, when you think about this whole Springfield and the Haitians, what's the connection? Uh, You know, look no farther than Governor Mike DeWine. Uh, The DeWines lost a daughter when she was 22 in a car accident. Mm -hmm. And back in the 90s, I don't know if they got Clinton Global Initiative dollars for Haiti, but they went down and commemorated and founded a school in her name yes. near Port-au-Prince. Yes. They had a, a priest go down there, Tom Hagen, to run it. At its peak, high water mark, there were 5,000 students. Now, I don't know if that's multiple facilities, but when you think about it, he's always had this soft spot for the Haitian people down there. So I'm sure he was a conduit this is, to bring them there. This is what I'm suspicious about. And given DeWine's history, I'm suspicious about it for a bunch of reasons, including that he was taking money from the children's hospitals. So when an anti-sex mutilation bill ends up on his desk, he vetoes it. 
which is what they wanted. Yeah. Uh, and the same thing mm-hmm. happened with Norfolk Southern, East Palestine, Ohio. Train goes off the rails. Guess who's right there to stand up for them? Uh, it's the guy who took their money. So that, that keeps happening, and that's why I'm suspicious of him now, Tom. Yeah, he's a swamp creature. So, you know, I mean, it's you just follow the money on events. We'll try to. Thanks, Tom. Tom calling in from Ohio. He knows he's right on the ground there. You can see what's happening. Thank you for that call. Hey, coming up, we're going to chat with Reagan Reese, the White House correspondent for the Daily Caller. She's been digging in on the money trail of CBS News executives. This is important ahead of that vice presidential debate.